Thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us through your word and through our life experiences. Thank you for Chris and his teaching. I pray that uh, your hand will be upon him as he tells us about these things in Revelation that we that we want to know about. And uh, I pray that it will enlighten us and help us to understand uh, your word better. All of it, not just Revelation, but all of it. Uh, yes. I thank you for the way that he integrates Revelation with other scriptures in the Old Testament and New Testament and um, brings new meaning to all of that. And so continue to give us that, Father God, and um, let this uh, learning of ours uh, be helpful in our life as well. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Doug. All right, the floor is yours, Dr. Smith. Okay. All right, so John will, will join us at some point. So uh, I'm assuming everyone is going to be happy to read today, all 400 of you. Yes, everyone. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to see who's sitting there way in the back of the room. Uh, it's Gail and Ginny and... Uh, Gordon's over there. Brown. Gordon. 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 Gordon will read today? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Boy. Uh, there are some days. <laughs> see Deborah. No, that, it's, see... it's a short crowd today. Is Dennis, Dennis there? Uh, no, no, just who you see. Doug? And uh, Brownie's with us. That makes it official. So. Great. Right. And is Edward there? I can't see her. Is Edward, is Edward with us? No, he's no. not going to be with us today. Okay. Start All right. So we, what, what we see is what we get. There's three, Gail four. Gail is five. not here then? Uh, Gail, Gail is. Gail is. Ginny? Gail, Brian. Ginny. Please not. Rachel, Raquel, Rob, Rachel, Okay. She's just trying to get the readers. So yeah. 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 All right. If you want to throw up that first slide. Okay. Today's class is going to be uh this 21st class that we've had on the book of revelation and uh wow it's amazing and we just got into the first four or five verses last week of chapter eight and as we <clears throat> excuse me as well as we always like to do uh we briefly review what we covered the weeks before uh, the week before to catch us up and since it's been two weeks now uh there might be a little <laughs> <laughs> things that we might want to repeat a little bit remember at the end of chapter six we had the uh sixth seal and then that very powerful question who can stand against all this the rock uh, the people the ungodly were asking the rocks to fall on them they they couldn't handle divine judgment and it was we were left with that powerful question who can stand and then what, what, what we're expecting in the next verse is the seventh seal. But what do we get in the next verse that begins chapter seven? We don't get that. We get those four angels that are about to uh, devastate the world with all these four winds, but we get delay. We don't get the seventh seal. We don't get the seventh seal until chapter eight, the chapter that we're in today. So we have this interlude, this pause and why? Because an act of redemption has to uh, uh, be performed so that the people of God can be sealed and protected to go through the time of great tribulation and through the period of divine judgment. Remember, we had the, the first vision of the 144,000 followed by the whole multitude that are praising God because they were sealed and God got them through and they were able to stand. So the question that was asked in the end of chapter six is answered in chapter seven. And then, but we still don't have the seventh seal. When we move to chapter eight in verse one, we saw that powerful opening of the seventh seal. But anybody remember what, what event took place in the opening of the seventh seal that began this new vision? 
What was the powerful thing that happened? Or maybe not so much, well, it is powerful, but surprising thing that happened in verse one of chapter eight, something we would never have expected at the opening following the sixth seal. Silence. Silence for a half an hour. And remember we learned that the morning ritual in the temple, uh, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and, and give the offerings and prayer, it was about a half an hour. So we're seeing the connection. If we have any Jewish literacy at all, we're seeing the connection between that reverential worshipful silence that all of heaven uh, honors that connects in a few verses later, verse five, that we, we left off with last, last time of the prayers of the saints. So the seventh seal is connecting all of those verses of the prayers of the saints in an incredibly powerful way in this new vision in chapter eight. So let's remember that. So eight opens with that absolute silence at the coming, at the opening of the seventh seal. And we're gonna see why that's really important and why the prayers of the saints is so important in these verses because silence, pre silence prepares our imagination to receive an incredible truth that chapter eight is going to unveil. We're gonna learn a powerful spiritual truth that the prayers of the martyred saints that ascend to God return to the earth with Im immense force. It's what Eugene Peterson described as reversed thunder. The title of his book on the book of Revelation is reversed thunder. And it's about chapter eight and verse five, as we're going to see. So let's have Brownie start us off and just quickly, we'll read through up to verse five to get us reacquainted. So Brownie, if you'd like to read verse one for us. Okay. Is it going to be on the screen? Yeah. Okay. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Excellent. Great reading. Great reading. So remember how this was the time when the people of God all in heaven, including the living creatures who sung hymns of praise to God day and night, night and day, unceasingly, even they were hushed during this important time of silence for the offering of the saints and the martyrs consequential prayers that we're going to see uh, shortly hereafter. Now let's uh, move to verse 2 and remind ourselves of what happens following verse 2, which we wouldn't have expected. And let's, let's have, um, yeah, let's have Don Andrus read verse 2 for us. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Okay, now notice the, the, those three words there, and I saw, we've already learned from, the, from many uses, uh, many times of that, that we're talking about the auditory markers that the people hearing it for the first time, or not just necessarily the first time, but hearing it know that this is establishing a new stage in John's vision. And I saw it's a new vision, but wait a minute. The, we just had the opening of the seventh seal. Well, why do we have a new vision after we're be, being given the, this seventh seal opening? You, you would think something would come of it other than silence. Well, remember, these are the seven archangels that always stand before God. It's not just Michael, the only one mentioned explicitly in Revelation, and not Gabriel, as mentioned in Luke, but the other five as well. All of them are given trumpets. Now, trumpet is going to be the biggest prop for the next three chapters, just like seals was the biggest prop in the earlier chapters. And we're going to find out that trumpets mean either warfare or worship. And that it's both here, of course, but we're going to see which one is going to be more dominant in the verses to come. So we're wondering why is that we are we getting this interruption or seeming interruption with 
another set of vision, another set of vision judgments uh, right after the seventh seal. We're going to find that out momentarily, but until we do, we're going to have uh, Doug, if he doesn't mind, read verse three for us. Okay. Verse three. Good. Revelation 8.3, another angel with a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given a great quantity of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, altar that is before the throne. Excellent reading. Yes, and notice that it's the prayers of all the saints. We're now seeing the explicit connection between chapter five, when we hear about the prayers of the saints are incense to God. And then in chapter six, nine, the martyrs under this same altar, this very same altar, the martyrs are crying out, when, O oh Lord, how long before we, you procure judgment for us? And here it's all connected with the divine judgments in a way that it was only implied in the earlier verses. Let's now move to verse four and have Gail read that one to help us uh, unpack this further. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Excellent. Now notice what we have underlined there. Prayers. Again, just like in verse 3, the emphasis is on the prayers of the saints. And just as before in 6 9, the prayers of the, altar, uh, of the martyrs under the same altar beseech God for justice on their behalf, here, as we're going to see in the very next verse, that prayer is not only heard, but it's answered. And here we're given this added dimension of the smoke of the incense. In this context, the smoke is an important visible sign of the prayers arising before God, the one who sits on the throne. Now we're going to have verse 5, which we left off with and, and began introduced last week. And let's have Ginny read that verse for us. Revelation 8, 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay, great reading. So there's a lot in verse 5 that's giving us further insight into the plan of God and the role the people of God will play. Notice it's filled the censer is filled with the prayers of the saints, as we've already learned in verse 4, but it's also filled with fire. And what does he do with it? Not just with the fire, with the prayers of the saints, it's thrown to the earth. And how we know this is divine judgment, if we didn't already figure it out from the Old Testament symbolism of fire, is the peals of thunder, rumblings, and flashes of lightning. We've already seen that back in the throne room vision in chapter four with the theophany of the one who sits on the throne and the elemental forces of nature are under his control, control and they are manifested in this theophany. But here, what's added to that is and an earthquake, which obviously signifies that judgment is coming. So now we're seeing that the prayers of the saints are returning to the earth in wrath. We didn't have that explicitly in four, five, six, or seven. Now we're seeing the direct and important role the people of God are going to play in, in this regard. Um, let's remind ourselves too that uh, it's not destruction, but repentance is what God re desires, and he's going to use the church, and especially... Uh-oh. Now, <laughs> now the, I think it's on his end. And getting God's will done. Can you okay? Chris, you froze for a second. 
Okay. So basically what we're learning here in verse five and for verse four and five is what has been implied since way back in chapter five, that the prayers of the saints, not just the martyrs, but you notice he said all the prayers of the saints. He didn't qualify it in that previous verse. We play a role, and especially in our suffering witness to the divine truth and the gospel and Jesus Christ, like Jesus did, our forerunner, and the one who set the pattern, we're going to play a role in God's plan for the world. And it's, it's stated here explicitly because the prayers go up and the fire comes down. You can't get more explicit than that. And so what we have here is the grand finale of the seventh seal. Now we're seeing why we had that absolute silence for a half an hour. It's so God's, God can hear the prayers of God's people and use them to continue on with the cycle of judgments for the unrepentant, the ungodly, and those who are defying and disobeying the, the Lord the Lord. So it's obvious from this absolute silence through all heaven in this opening of the seventh seal that John is witnessing how the prayers of God's people are heard by God and he responds. So to put it in a sentence, John's eyewitness account that we're privy to here in chapter eight is a spiritual truth that's meant to convince us of the potency of prayer. It's the prayers of the saints that return to the earth in divine judgment, because as the prayers rise up, the fire comes down. And guess what? We have this same kind of imagery in the book of Ezekiel. And let's have Rob read that verse uh, when that slide, slide number seven, comes up on Ezekiel 10. Ezekiel 10, 2. The Lord said to the angel, the man clothed in linen, fill your hands with burning coals and scatter them over the city. Okay, great. So we have this same thing going on where divine judgment is playing out with the idea of prayers and incense, etc., following the marking. And, and you know what's interesting about this as a, as a parallel to verse 5 and 6 in Revelation 8 is the previous chapter in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 9, also has the marking and the sealing of the righteous on their foreheads to protect them, just like in the previous chapter in Revelation, chapter 7, there were before judgments could be uh, meted out against the unelect, God's people had to be sealed. Remember, they were the four angels were held, told to hold back the, the devastating winds until God's people had been sealed. But this raises an important question at this point. Why, why do we have these trumpets and all of that stuff right smack in the middle of all this other stuff dealing with the prayers of the saints and the judgment. They're, they're poised, ready to blow these seven trumpets of judgments right in the middle of all this other really important activity, especially after the opening of the seventh seal. Well, the answer can only be found from one source. It's from realizing the medium in which this book was written. And this is why many interpreters get it wrong, unintentionally and, and wanting to get it right and trying to get it right with what the tools they're using. But if you're trying to build a house and you're using a toothbrush, if you're using the wrong tool, you're not gonna build a house. Or if you do, it's a pretty pathetic one. It's the same thing with reading a book without the proper interpretive tools. Well, what book, what kind of medium is this? It's apocalyptic. So let's have for the next slide to see the 
literary technique that apocalyptic is using here to help us understand why what seems to be mumbo jumbo mishmash here in chapter eight. Let's have Wendy, let's give Wendy the honor. Arby just thought that Wendy should, should give us this one. <laughs> apocalyptic literary technique, interlocking or interweaving. Okay. Now we've already seen, seen the apocalyptic a uh, rhetorical device of interlocking way back at the end of chapter three. If you remember the house, uh, the house church in Laodicea, bad news and all that, uh, they thought they needed nothing. They didn't even need Christ because remember at the very last verse, he's standing outside the doors of their hearts and he's knocking, knocking persistently, trying to come in back into their lives. And he's trying to get in. And we're left with that image with the final uh, vision cycle, the very first vision cycle uh, to all seven churches, right? What's the very next thing that we get? We get a new vision, but it interlocks with the previous in that now it's John that's seeing not a closed door, but an open door. And it's not Jesus coming in, it's God calling John to come in to the open door in heaven. So there's an interlocking of the first vision to the second. Here we're getting the same thing going on between the seventh seal that plays out and it interlocks, it, it interconnects with the seven trumpets, the new cycle of judgment visions. Now we're going to see three judgment cycle of visions. We've had the first, the seals. We're now in the second one, the judgment, uh, judgment trumpet seals of which there again, of course, there are seven followed by a third cycle. And so if it seems like it's repetitious, guess what? It is. Mm -hmm. That's what apocalyptic does. Ah, but there's variation, significant variation, because notice that even though we're going to see as we go through each of the trumpets, there's going to be repetition. Notice that we get this new explicit unveiling of the connection that God's people play uh, through intercessory prayer and supplication to God that we only had implicitly in the first judgment cycles. So, and on top of all of that, even though we keep having recapitulation and interlocking, what we're also going to keep seeing, because this, after all, is a narrative. Notice that we have an introduction, and then we have an epilogue. We have an ending in chapter 22. So it is also sort of a narrative where we're seeing prog progression in a storyline. And what's the connection? Repetition with variation with increasing intensity. That's what we're gonna see. We saw a quarter of the world getting nailed. We're gonna see something a little more than that as we move through the judgment cycles of the trumpets and after the trumpets. So to put it in another way, if the seal judgments are terrifying and horrible and they are, then the trumpet cycle of judgments are gonna be even worse. And the ones following those, the bulls, are going to be even worse than the trumpets and worse than the seals. So again, repetition, variation, and deepening intensity, all along giving us more clues, more unveiling of God's plan, and filling in some of the gaps that we haven't had along the way. So does that make any sense to you at this point? I'm giving you the broad strokes of it. Yeah. Okay. Now, you're not going to see this kind of stuff in any other literary genre. If you read First Enoch, Second Baruch, Fourth Ezra, all the lots, they do the same kind of stuff. It's the nature of symbolic literature. It's the nature of this medium. And I think by the time we get past chapter 11, if not sooner, when a lot of stuff comes together for us, we're going to see why in God's divine providence, he chose this medium, this particular me this particular literary delivery message to use to give us the climax of all biblical revelation. 
it just lends itself better to describing more or less the indescribable. All right, with that in mind, ready to move on uh, to verse six and let's have um, Betty read verse six for us. Betty, she's there. All right, I, oh. Revelation 8, 6. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets made ready to blow them. Excellent. Now remember, these are the seven archangels and they have those seven trumpets and they're made, so they're all poised, they're ready to rock and roll. And this is our cue that this is now that second cycle of judgment visions. So now the interlocking has, is complete and now we're, we're gonna run with the new cycle of visions that are uh, yet to be played out. Now, if you recall, remember in the se uh, seal uh, judgments, we noticed that we had, it began in chapter six, and then we wanted the seventh seal to follow in chapter seven, we didn't get it. We got an entire chapter of an interlude, a delay, a redemptive act and all of that, but we had a whole chapter between the sixth seal and the seventh seal that comes to us in 8.1. So if you thought there was a gap or uh, an inter a small interlude with the first judgment seals, it's even greater with the trumpets. It's not one chapter, it's two and a half chapters between the sixth trumpet and the seventh. So we got to keep that in mind. And because it's extending over so many chapters, this particular, uh, the second judgment vision cycle, it's really important information. It's important, it's valuable for us because it plays a major role in shaping the way God's purposes are to be understood. So there's a lot, even though there's judgment and, okay, I've, I've been there, seen that, I've seen this movie before. No, it's way more than that. There's things that are gonna play out in these judgments that are gonna be helpful for us to further understand the divine plan. Okay, so trumpets, why trumpets? Remember the trumpet of the Lord in the Old Testament often announced the coming day of the Lord's wrath. Also, if we look at the contemporary Jewish apocalyptic text outside of Revelation, which was also there uh, living and breathing within the house churches and all through Judaism and, and Christianity at the time, it meant uh, the trumpets of God meant the devastation of the end of the age. And Zephaniah is just one of Old Test many Old Testament texts that conveys that same truth. So let's have for this next sl slide on Zephaniah to show us the parallel in the Old Testament for the coming day of the Lord of wrath and all that. Let's have Brownie, if she doesn't mind, read uh, Zephaniah for us. I do not us. mind reading. Zephaniah 1, 14a, 16a, and 18a. Mm -hmm. The great day of the Lord is near, a day of trumpet and battle cry, because they have sinned against the Lord. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Mm -hmm. Great job. Great job. So that's exactly what we're, we have all throughout the Old Testament, where here in Re Revelation 8, it's echoing these same trumpet uh, trumpet blasts that are uh, in anticipation of divine judgment. And it's also in anticipation of the first trumpet to be blown now in verse seven. And so for that, for verse seven, it'd be great to have uh, Dawn Andrus read verse seven. Revelation eight, seven. The first angel blew his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were hurled to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Excellent, excellent. So notice the intense. Notice how this is reminiscent of the devastation of the earth and the seals, 
and there it was a quarter of the earth. Well, guess what? The ante has been upped. Now it's a third of the earth. But notice also at the same time, two thirds of the earth are, is spared. So yes, it's divine judgment, but the divine judgment is limited. Yes, it's growing in its intensity, but it's still controlled. It's still contained. It's still tempered. Notice that what we've underlined here for the first part of 8-7 in this first initial trumpet of the archangel, there came hail and fire. Anybody know from your Old Testament knowledge, what does, what does this sound like to you? A plague of hail and fire. Sodom and anybody, anybody know? Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, yeah, that's a good answer. Uh, even wait, even before that one. Okay. E Egypt. Egypt. The plagues right. in Egypt. Exactly. Great, Betty. Yes, this is very clearly a parallel. It might have been also an allusion uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah. So Doug isn't wrong, uh, but clearly they're gonna, we're going to see in f at least four of these seven a direct allusion to the plagues in Egypt uh, that were meted out against Pharaoh and, and all of those in his, in his, um, under his rule that were keeping God's people in bondage. And notice too, that it's mixed with fire, uh, reminiscent of course, of the fire that displays God's power and wrath, certainly a clear echo of God's judgments on the Egyptians, but we're gonna see that is not all. Um, so now we're going to have Doug read verse 7, 8, 8, 7 again, and now we're going to underline the new bit or the new dimension to it that uh, transcends uh, the, the plague parallel in Egypt. Do we want to know about this? <laughs> <laughs> Revelation 8, 7. First angel blew his trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, wherever the blood came from, and they were hurled to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Fire. And blood. So we have this mixed with blood. Now, why blood? Well, He's going, uh, John, as we've already seen, likes uh -oh. to start with an Old Testament text, but then he doesn't, he's not slavishly uh, dependent on it. It's a spring, it's more of a springboard than a cage in which he surrounds the text. And so here, mixed with blood, going off, this, off the script is obviously an intensification of God's first display of might and power in judgment. But aren't we also to see the connection here with blood between the prayers of the martyred saints and the plagues of the ungodly? The prayers of the saints who gave their lifeblood in faithful witness are now seeing blood falling from the heavens in divine judgment. Powerful stuff. God listens but he also responds. So let's have Gail read it one more time to get this last bit of the first trumpet. Revelation 8, 7, the first angel blew his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were hurled to the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grasses were burned up. Excellent. So again, we're seeing repetition and we're seeing clearly this allusion to the type, the first uh, divine judgment in the form of a plague. Uh, but now we've got the archetype at the end and it's not a quarter, it's a third. And it's clearly helping us to see the ongoing dramatic narrative unfolding through these recycling of judgments, yet at the same time, a steady increase in intensity. Well, we're not done yet. This is only trumpet number one. 
Let's have Jenny now read verse eight for us. Jenny. Yeah. Revelation 8.8. 8. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Jenny. So we, we've got now the second trumpet. And notice that with each blast of these two trumpets now, we're seeing a different part of the world attacked, but the destruction isn't total. Why not? Because this is only the prelude to the end. We already learned that throughout the Old Testament, fire is about divine judgment. We're going to see that in four of these seven trumpet blasts, fire is going to attend the outpouring of God's wrath. Now, let's look closely there at what happens. Here, we're finding a fiery object is probably here a meteor or a meteorite uh, and, and maybe not a star, uh, maybe not a planet or anything because uh, or a mountain, because he doesn't say it is. He says it's like one. And again, this is very much like the plague in Egypt. With Egypt, it was to show to Pharaoh God's great and unmatchable power. But here too, it's meant to capture the attention of the world's inhabitants to acknowledge God and to repent. Now at this point, um, at this point, I made a decision to do something I don't normally do. I've usually virtually always have stayed with the text at hand and only referred to text later in Revelation if they helped clarify what's going on. That's the only reason I would do it because I don't want to take away from the flow and the context as, as this thing is unfolding for us. But I'm going to make an exception uh, in this case with the judgment uh, cycles of the trumpets because it extends for so long and it might not be uh, immediately obvious the point of all this when later on, later on in the chapter, he says it, uh, the revelation says explicitly the reason for these divine judgments. So I'd like uh, Rob to read a little bit ahead here in verse 20 about why these divine judgments uh, nailing a third of the earth. Revelation 9:20. The rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Okay, so let's leave that slide up for a moment. We're already deep at this point in verse 20, we're already deep in the trumpet judgments. And so many people have already died because of these divine judgments. I mean, when you're nailing a third of the earth, that's going to affect a lot of people. Notice it's saying that the other group, the two thirds that could have learned from it did not. They did not repent of the works of their hands or give up any of their idolatries. And see, all of this can be symbolic. It doesn't necessarily it isn't meant to be literal silver and bronze and stone. It's whatever, whatever is our God. And here we're being told the reason for the judgments is to get people to wake up and honor God, the uncreated creator as God. And still they didn't do it. Let's look at the next verse, which spells it out yet again. Let's have Wendy read that if she would. Revelation 9.21, and they did not repent of their murders or sorceries or their fornication or their thefts. So that's pretty astounding that we have all of these divine judgments that are meted out on the earth over and over again. Again, doesn't it seem like a parallel to Egypt and the Pharaoh is hard hardened? And then at the very end, 
It, and when the text says God hardened his heart, if you read that text, now for those of you that want to believe that there, there is some semblance of free will, it's important to realize that the Hebrew there is saying God confirmed him in his hardened heart. It wasn't that he said, okay, I'm done with you and uh, I'm going to force you into perdition and into uh, self-annihilation and all that. No, he gave him one opportunity after another, after another. And then after a certain point, God confirmed him in it. It's a lot, it's more or less a parallel to Revelation 118 and following where, where people gives people up to their, to their, uh, their apostasy. He gives people up to their indulgences that go beyond the pale after a certain point. In other words, God allows us, remember how Paul puts it? God allows us to grieve the Spirit of God. So if we can't resist God, if we can't legitimately say, God, I, I don't want you, if we can't do it, how could we ever grieve him? We can't. We can grieve him. He allows it. Could he disallow it? Of course he could, but he, he allows it. He allows people to oppose him. But he and, and he allows us to a certain point, and af, after at that certain point, he will confirm an individual in it. At what point that is, who knows? Only he does. But the point here is all of these two-thirds that had every opportunity to come and ra around and realize that God was God aren't doing it. So that's why we need to understand this in this vision cycle that it's redemptive. See, the judgments are discipline. We often think that mercy and judgment, mercy and discipline are opposites. No, they're connected. What parent that loves their children doesn't discipline them. We discipline and God disciplines us. God disciplined his own son. Why? Because he loves his son. And, and out of mercy, believe it or not, it's out of God's divine mercy that these judgments came. And we're gonna see later in chapter 11, they finally take root because we play a part in it as well. But they're always meant to be redemptive. It isn't vengeance. It, is, it, it isn't vindictiveness of any kind. So now we can go back and, and look at verse nine and have Betty read it and see that even the judgments are meant to be redemptive. So Betty, if you could read nine. Hang on, I just lost the picture. Oh, there it is. Revelation 8, 9, a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The picture shows the second trumpet and mm -hmm. fire and people, it looks like in a, a flaming sea, and yes. there's... Um, it says a third, a third, and a third over at the other side. Right. A third blood. I'm sorry, uh, I should have read that first. Oh, that's fine. A third so blood. You want me to read that all again? Yeah, you can. Yeah. A third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, the fish. And a third mm -hmm. of the ships were destroyed. Exactly. Great. And that, uh, that, image on the left of the third, third, third really brings them, <laughs> brings it all together for us to see. Uh, it's quite the calamity right. in this second trumpet. So thank you, Betty. So we've got an ocean of blood here. <laughs> Notice the theme of blood that keeps repeating here. It gives us a vivid sense that God has definitely heard the cries of the martyrs and he's responding. Later in the vision of the bowls in chapter 16, this idea connecting the blood of the martyrs and the blood of the ungodly in judgment, it's made directly and explicitly. Now let's focus in for a second on the ships. Notice you've got the sea and you've got uh, the living creatures within the sea. And then we got the ships in the sea. The word ship 
in Revelation is only used twice here in verse 9, here in the verse we're looking at, and then later in chapter 18. Why? Because he's trying to reinforce here the connection between the second trumpet warning blast of judgment with the all-encompassing judgment to come against and upon Babylon, and we'll find out that Babylon symbol symbolizes Rome or any, any superpower uh, opposed to God in the end time. And a third of the ships destroyed here in chapter eight have to do with the sailors and the shipmasters and all who had those ships that are lamenting the fall of Babylon in her climactic uh, catastrophe that wiped out all of their wealth and riches, not just a third, but completely. And so it's clearly here a warning blow for any and all to stop worshiping all those different things. Remember gold, silver, bronze, stone, and uh, all the idols that what? That Babylon was trafficking in before it's too late. Here, this vision of judgment against the ships and those who go across the sea, it's a warning to them of the bigger, bigger judgment to fall later as it unfolds uh, in chapter 18. But yet there's an even more important lesson to be learned here that undergirds these trumpet visions, these trumpet judgments. Remember they're based on the plagues of Egypt? What did they do for the Israelites? They provided the plagues of Egypt, provided for them a prelude to God's deliverance of them out of bondage in Egypt and the promise of the, of the new land, Canaan, the promised land that was awaiting them following the judgments. This is, there's no mistake here that John is showing us the type that we have in the Egyptian plagues for the hope and the assurance that this gives the people of God after the judgments and after the great tribulation. Why? Because what we're seeing here is the, is the spiritual truth that pain for, in tribulation of the saints is fleeting, but salvation and victory that follows are forever. On that note, let's take uh, our, our time for our break, if that's what we're going to do at this juncture. Yeah. All right, and five minutes. Yeah, five minutes, and All then right, we'll please. come right back. Yes, Great. Sir. Thank you. In that case, we're going to have Dawn and uh, read slide uh, for 810. Revelation 8.10, the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Excellent. Great. So now we've got the third angel blowing his trumpet, and if the oceans weren't, if the oceans weren't spared, now we're seeing that the freshwater parts of the world aren't spared either. Uh, so this third trumpet is going to have two verses uh, in meeting out the judgment. Uh, so let's have Brownie read verse 11 for us, uh, which extends the description of this third trumpet blast. Revelation 8, 11. And the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died from the water because it was made bitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a glass of liquid there on the left that you're not gonna wanna drink. All right, so here this star is named for what it does. It contaminates the rivers and waterways with wormwood. Now this small gray leaf plant was so bitter that even a tiny amount could make food and water literally untouchable. 
And this lethal quality of wormwood here in Revelation reflects the Old Testament comparison of this plant, deadly plant, to poison. And let's have Doug read one of many Old Testament texts that conveys that point. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am feeding this people with wormwood and giving them poisonous water to drink. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me. These first three trumpet plagues. <coughs> excuse me, I choked on my on my drink. The first three trumpets affect land and water, but now that we're going to move to the next verse that we're going to have Gail read if she if she doesn't mind, the fourth trumpet is going to affect not just land and water, but the heavens. Revelation 8, 12. The fourth angel blows trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light was darkened, a third of the day was kept from shining, and likewise the night. Indeed. All the consequences. All right. Excellent. Now, see how this is reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. It happens to be uh, the parallel to the ninth one, which preceded Israel's deliverance. Then in that plague, the initial type of what we have here in the archetype, the Egyptians, all the Egyptians suffered darkness for three full days. Here, the whole earth is partially darkened not just e Egypt, but the whole world is darkened. And likewise, the night, the intensity of the light and the illumination normally experienced from the moon and stars diminished by a third. All of this has reminiscences of the many Old Testament prophetic texts that signify God's judgment upon the world for its evil. Egypt was a type of evil and obstruction and opposition to God's plan and will. And here, the archetype, the whole world. Egypt was the type that represented later and anticipated later the archetype of the whole world, all the pharaohs, if you will, of the world uh, now under judgment. So indeed, we might expect that what follows next is going to be the fifth trumpet. And eventually it does. Uh, in the verse after verse 13, but it does so only after an ominous buildup for the fifth uh, trumpet and the other remaining trumpet blasts yet to come. And let's have Pastor Jonathan, who is honoring us with his, uh, his presence, read the slide for verse 13. Revelation 8, 13. Then I looked and heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew in mid heaven. Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Amen. Yes, good reading. And notice that we have uh, a lot of series of threes in these trumpets. And here's yet another one of whoa, whoa, whoa. And now the King James Version translates, and I looked and I heard an angel crying with a loud voice as it flew, flew in mid heaven. We don't have angel here. We're following the NRSV and the NIV and the better uh, manuscripts that are much earlier than the Textus Receptus. It, it's the name of the bulk of text that Erasmus, the guy that translated in, uh, from Greek into English back in uh, 1711, 1611, whenever the King James Bible was written, they, they based those texts on much later Greek manuscripts. And the later ones, because the word eagle and angel are so close uh, in, in their, in their uh, spelling, uh, it might have been for that reason, but for whatever reason, it's definitely not angel here, but eagle because 
for a lot of reasons. One, uh, in the Greco-Roman world of, of that day, the eagle was regarded as the revealer of the divine will. And remember, how they have, if you've done any reading in ancient Rome, uh, Roman times, these people were fascinated with birds. I mean, birds were where they got all their omens and all their predictive powers, et cetera, of what's going to happen in the future. And the, and the eagle was, was the top bird, if you will. In fact, the eagle was literally uh, the, the one that was Zeus in eagle form. Over and over again, when Zeus would come, remember uh, the uh, Odyssey and the Iliad, et cetera, you got an eagle here, there, and everywhere, and it's one of the gods, and usually it's Zeus. So here, we got this eagle flying in mid heaven. The word there in the Greek, for the word there, literally, now in this vision, he's seeing nothing, no created stuff, nothing, just in mid heaven, he sees this one lone eagle flying across it and yelling out, whoa, whoa, whoa. Very, very startling, very demonstrative, very striking. And it's reminiscent of the fears and the idea that, that Greco-Roman people had about birds in the sky. They would portend, they would be ominously telling you about what's going to come down. Well, when you hear the word woe, does that mean pleasure? <laughs> it doesn't, no, it doesn't. It means the opposite. And all again, uh, John likes to use contemporary society with you know, We've already seen that, remember, in chapters two and three, he would at some points, he would echo what's going on in Roman culture and then parody it, or he would bring out, and obviously underneath, all, undergirding all of that would always be his old richness of the Old Testament text. And so what he's doing here with the woe is bringing, bringing out the point that whenever you hear woe, that's uh, an imminent divine judgment to strike. So he's combining the two here. And the eagle uh, was the, be, also believed in, in uh, John's day to be the surest uh, revealer of heaven's messengers, the surest, uh, most faithful one. But here in Revelation, it's the messenger of the creator himself. Now, why an eagle? Well, all we have to do is think back to the throne room vision. Remember the theophany of chapter four? What was one of the living creatures? An, an eagle. So he's just using that eagle uh, yet again for another purpose. Uh, in this case, to warn of the divine judgment about to strike. So what we've got here before we move on is we're again seeing this interlocking, this recapitulation this, uh, this repetition with variation and deeper intensity. How are we seeing the repetition? Remember one group of this judgment seal, the sealed seals of judgment, one group were the first four. Remember the four apocalyptic horsemen? And then we got to the fifth seal and it was the martyrs under the altar and the sixth seal were all, all heaven and Hades breaks out. So you had the, the, the four, which were one group, followed by this magnitude of another level of the second group of five, six, and seven, right? Same thing with the trumpets. In the first four judgments here in the trumpets, it's of the same ilk. It's affecting the earth, right? But the last three, are of a different nature and magnitude. In fact, in this case, it's further emphasized by this, this graphic depiction of the warning of this eagle flying across mid heaven, calling out, whoa, whoa, whoa. So that it, it's, it's showing us in, in, in more demonstrative fashion, the very thing that we already saw with the seals. And so, What's important about this is what we're going to see that follows 
also is going to play into how the interlude is going to ha have its effect just like it did and have meaning and purpose just as it did in the seal judgments. All right. So one last thing that we need to learn about the trumpets affecting the earth and the mark of a return to chaos. We've noticed that in all four of them, it's not directly against the people that are evil doers. It's against the earth. It's on the earth, the sea, the land, the sky, etc. But it's not directly affecting. Indirectly, it's affecting them, but it's on the, the life support systems that, that people use, even the ships. That's going to affect people, but it's the ships that are destroyed, not the people in the ships, per se, or, or the people that build the ships, etc. And also, what we're going to find out in the seals, uh, in the trumpets that follow, is that they are now going to affect directly those inhabitants and here's the new thing. Only those who have not the mark and the seal of God on their forehead. These new judgments, again, it ties back to verse 5 and 6 of the prayers of the saints that are heard. And the divine judgment is, is set and stamped exclusively for those who don't have the seal of God, who don't belong to the people of God, them and only them. So with that in mind, I think we're ready after seeing what we've got here uh, with this anticip anticipatory woes uh, to do a review of the entire chapter that we've just uh, went through in chapter eight. So let's uh, have um, Ginny read this review slide for chapter eight. Can I see it? No. <laughs> How about, why don't I read this one, Chris? Because it's really hard it's to really see. Sad. Okay. 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 <laughs> I, I, can, I, I can read this one. Um, okay. okay Arby's so, saying okay. Arby says, all right, well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, upper left hand, first trumpet. Hail, fire, blood, and burned one third of the earth and trees and all the grass. Then on the upper right, second trumpet, a third of the sea equals blood, sea animals, dead, and ships destroyed. Then uh, lower left hand side, third trumpet is wormwood. Mm -hmm. Wormwood star poisons a third of the rivers and springs, and many die. And then lower right hand, fourth trumpet. A third of the sun, moon, stars, day and night are darkened. Uh, excellent job. Very, very good. Thank you. Yeah. This gives us a lot of yeah. this slide gives us, you know, really packs it all together for us to see how we're moving things along uh, with greater intensity, but certainly uh, the repetition of what we already had for the most part in the ju seal judgments. Okay. So, what do you think we're meant to take away from chapter eight and the vision here in chapter eight? What, what would be a key point? Uh, if you're going to share uh, what we're, you're learning in Revelation with someone that wants to know what happened in this chapter, what would be one of the things that you would consider a key point uh, that's been conveyed through John's vision? The prayers of the saints were heard definitely and God really responded to those prayers. Right, absolutely. That's a great point, Wendy. That's that's we haven't had that point you just made, we haven't had explicitly until this chapter. It's been there, but indirectly and only implicitly. Now it's spelled out uh explicitly that God incorporates our prayers into his plan for the redemption of the nations. Uh, key point, good job. Anyone else? Uh, that, that God is continuing with judgments, trying to get people to respond to him in a positive way. Just like, just like I think uh, Peter said in first or second Peter, um, Hmm. 
he is not slack concerning his promise, but he is patient with you, wishing that all would come to repentance, something like that. Yeah, no, no, no. That's a that that text definitely uh, is illuminative because we often look at delay as indifference or uh, cavalier or doesn't care, et cetera. No, God's delay, what we perceive as delay is an orchestra, part of his or grand orchestrated plan to get as many people to wake up and honor him as, as the uncreated creator and to share and enjoy and experience his love and his grace so that he doesn't have to give them what they want, even though what they want doesn't help them. He wants to avoid that. And that's why these delays are, are meant to, are redemptive. He is more patient than any of us has ever been. And that's why this is another reason that shows us yet again, why God is not vindictive. He's not vengeful. He's, he's pure and merciful and all of those things that we learn about him, even in the Old Testament. And remember Christ. I mean, remember how uh, in John's gospel, we're to, we're, remember the, his disciples who say, okay, we're ready. Show us the Father. Go ahead. Show us him now, now, now that we're comfortable with what you're doing and what you're about. And his answer was, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what do we see in Jesus? We see divine grace that no one has ever seen. We're, we're seeing the mercy and the loving kindness. Remember the woman at the well? Mm. He said, all he says to her is go and sin no more. That's all he says to her. She was caught red-handed. And I love how, how that plays out. Remember how the, you're hearing these rocks drop to the ground first by the oldies, the elders. They're the first ones to drop the rocks when he said, he who hasn't sinned ever, Go ahead, hurl that first stone at her. And they were the first to leave. The longer we live, the more we know we need God's mercy and grace because Jesus embodied it. Amen? So that's a great point. That's a really great point. Any, anyone get anything else out of chapter eight? Hey, Chris. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, you know, you talk about the delay and I was thinking about two different delays. Uh, hmm. The, where... God uh, delayed, but it was, you know, ends up in judgment, but it also ends up in deliverance. And the mm. first one I'm thinking of is mm. the uh, Israelites in Egypt, yeah. 400, year, 400 year delay. Right. And um, they're crying out, they're praying, it seems like nothing's happening. Mm. And uh, they're still having to uh, endure slavery and oppression. And, you know, and then, and then Moses comes, the plagues come, and and the, and sorry about the dogs here oh, and then the uh you know moses comes the, the plagues come on the egyptian judgment comes upon them but then deliverance happens yes. you know and then i'm thinking you know the uh, the intertestamental period is about a 400 year period where well, there's no word from god nothing right. at all no prophet and right. then john the baptist shows up on the scene yes. and right. again you know uh there's deliverance that happens but it's mm. like these long periods of delay. I mean, interesting enough, there's 400 years for both of those times. Yeah. Um, and then deliverance comes. Mm. Uh, judgment comes, but deliverance comes, you know? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get that into my brain too, about uh, God's sense of delay. I mean, for mm. us, 400 years seems like forever and ever and ever and ever, like he doesn't give a rip. And then all this, you know, and then he, and then he responds, uh, you know, and, and he responds in a, in a dramatic way, judges those who are, who are, um, you know, evil, uh, Egyptians, and, mm -hmm. you know, and then he, he delivers. So I don't know, I'm just, I'm just, that was just rumbling through my brain as you were talking about uh, the, uh, the delay of God, the, the, this little um, parenthetical delay that he has. Yeah, no, those are great points. And, and that, that parallel to the plagues in Egypt, where on the one hand is divine judgment, on the other hand, it's divine deliverance. I mean, that's intentional. Uh, four of these seven plagues, four of these seven trumpets uh, are, are echoes, direct echoes of the plagues in Egypt. 
So that's another important thing for us to realize that these judgments are redemptive in nature uh, because they're also reassuring to God's people, just like with Israel. That meant the promise will be, uh, be fulfilled of giving them a way, a deliverance out of bondage into the new promised land. And that's just a type. What happened in Egypt is just a type of what happens to the people of God at the end. These plagues here that are at the end of salvation history are meant to reassure God's people that, yes, I've heard your prayers and divine judgment is falling. And guess what? After that, you're going to enjoy the fruits of your faithful endurance and faithful service to me. So at the same time as we got judgment, we've got deliverance, like you're saying, and all within what we can perceive as well, why don't you just get on with it? He doesn't get on with it any uh, one minute, one hour sooner than he needs to have it happen because in his sovereign omniscience, he realizes that there are people that are gonna come into the fold. And where we're gonna see this uh, play out climactically is when we get to chapter 11 and the two witnesses and what happens after their ministry. But we still got a ways to go before that. So those are good points and they're worth remembering uh, for chapter eight. Anyone else before we move on? Well, even though they're redemptive in nature, I keep thinking about the people that were there when all of this was happening. Mm. I mean, say it's awful is a kind of a small word. And that that um, I find it hard to see that they would have seen God being patient with them. Mm. But yeah. I myself in their place. It must have been mm. pretty scary. Yeah. Right. And that's the point is it in trial, if you're a Christian and you're undergoing trial and tribulation or uh, in the parts of the world that this actually happens, persecution, you're wanting God to instantly do whatever he does. But didn't Viktor Frankl want that when he's in a, a death camp uh, in, at Auschwitz? Didn't he want God to immediately solve his problem of, of not having to die like everyone in his family. So I can't recommend reading that book more for people, The Man's Search for Meaning. It, it really helps us understand that our perspective is should not be, well, what am I gonna get out of this from God? No, we've got it wrong. What is God trying to get out of us for him? When we look at it, when we flip it and see, wait a minute, God's got a purpose in this for me. I don't know why, but he does. And if I just trust him and I have faith and allow his divine grace to fill my life and to fill my heart through his divine spirit, by which he confirms to me that his spirit and my spirit are one, it, scripture tells us we don't have, this isn't just mind over matter stuff. If it was mind over matter, I would no longer be a Christian. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be a Christian if I didn't have uh, sometimes, I, I'm not going to try and claim to be some saint or some uh, person that uh, has all these numinous experiences day after day. I don't. But God at critical times in my own life has been faithful to me and help me to understand through his spirit, his love for me. Mother Teresa, you may not know this, but Mother Teresa, they while she was in, the, in, in process after her, her death, uh, the, the Catholic Church was in process of canonize, canonizing her as a saint. And one of the ways you have to do that is you gotta go through everybody's uh, material and what they've written and what they've their diaries and all that. Do you know that in her diary, her own personal diary, she would write in it from time to time, God, I don't feel you right now. I don't feel that you love me, etc. I Can you think of anyone more used of God in contemporary history than Mother Teresa? So there are times when we don't feel God, but I guarantee you that same diary had wonderful experiences and confirmations 
that God's spirit had affirmed and confirmed that she was beloved of God. That's what happened to Corey Ten Boom. Remember Corey Ten Boom and her sister? We don't get as much as we want as often as we want, but if we can just look at it from the perspective God is trying to get us to. My best model for all this is Paul. Paul, somehow, the guy that considered himself the worst apostle that, that God was gracious enough to allow him to be, learned that power is made complete in our own weakness. We grow the best under trial, under, under endurance, under the very things that we think God is not there for us. Paul learned that when those times come, that's when God can be there the strongest for us. That's a hard spiritual truth. It's a hard one, but it's, but it's real. And Paul, remember, he said, we despaired. Remember in 2 Corinthians, he said, we despaired even of life. He, he was thinking in his ministry at the height of it. He's thinking, you know what? This might be it. I might be martyred right here and now. He didn't leave it with that. He said, but we put our hope and trust in the living God. Now, those aren't words from somebody that's making that stuff up and someone that's trying to be a good Christian. That's a person speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit. Amen? And this is what John's vision as an eyewitness to what's going on in the unfolding of salvation history as it's yet to play out. This is what John is trying to encourage us to remember. What? That the prayer, our prayers are the engine driving the plan of God towards completion. Amen? That's what's going on here. And so we play a part because God does listen to us even though it doesn't always feel like he's listening to us. Okay, on that note, unless there's more comment, uh, let's move on to what is called chapter nine, first followed by the class uh, slide that tells us what lesson we're in, class number 21, and now we're into chapter nine. And so now we're gonna have Ginny who wasn't reading the last one, but can now, should be able to read 9-1, Ginger. Revelation 9-1. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the uh, abyss. Excellent. Excellent. Good reading. Okay, so now we've got the fifth angel blowing his trumpet. And so now we're, we're outside of the earth. Well, now we're in the heavenly realms. And, we, and he sees a star fallen from heaven to earth. And that star has been given, whatever that star is, has been given. Divine passive, the key to the shaft of the... Now the NRSV here, if you're following along in the NRSV, it's the bottomless pit. But I liked uh, the Greek there. The Greek for the word abyss here is abyss. Uh, and so I like what the NIV does with it. It seems more mysterious to say that. Um, so here we have our fifth, uh, fifth angel, uh, fifth archangel. And so now we're going to see the terrors coming upon the earth are beyond nature. Now they're more or less demonic. Now let's recall the stars and how they're symbolized in Revelation. Remember back in chapter one, way back in the very first uh, vision cycle, we had seven stars. Those seven stars represented seven. Remember where are stars? They're up in the sky. Angels, right. The seven angels that were serving the seven churches in Asia Minor. So the idea of a star here signifying an angel uh, goes back to chapter one, but it also harks back to the Jewish tradition uh, as well, including several Old Testament texts. I mean, we, there's a million of them. We don't have to go there. So what, what is not in dispute is the star is an angel. 
What is in dispute with some commentators is the nature of this angel. Is this angel a friend or is this angel a fiend? Well, let's look at the verse. Having fallen from heaven isn't exactly the most reassuring description of a celestial creature's manner of transport from heaven to earth, do you think? And, and if this isn't enough to convince us that what we have here is a demonic being, then let's look no further than the famous text in Isaiah about that great morning star, Lucifer himself, who had fallen from heaven. And let's have Rob, if he wouldn't mind, reading this slide of Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 12 to 13. How you are fallen from heaven, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will make myself like the most high. Amen. Okay, so we have the same description of a star falling from heaven in Lucifer himself, uh, because he was the morning, again, the, uh, Isaiah mentions him as the morning star. And if that's not a, enough for us to know that the star here is a demonic being, uh, in this very same chapter, in verse 11, we discover that the angel who is the king over the abyss is the not so proud owner of the less than charitable name, destroyer. So <laughs> what, what this demonic being is given is something rather powerful. We learn it in that first verse. He's given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit or the abyss. This is the third key or sets of keys already mentioned in Revelation. Now, an abyss is a place without limit to its depth, hence the NRSV translation, bottomless pit. And Revelation depicts this region as a demonic realm beneath the earth inhabited by demonic creatures and ruled by that sinister angel, Abaddon, or destruction. We find out later in Revelation that eventually Satan himself will be confined there before being released and thrown into the lake of fire. Let's have Wendy read this slide that gives us more info on the abyss. We skipped, we skipped something, so it's not too bad, but... <laughs> Abyss, demonic realm inhabited by demonic beings. Abyss, not the home of creatures from the natural world. Abyss, not Hades, where the dead are kept until judgment. Abyss and Hades, not the lake of fire. Great. Okay, so this bottomless pit or this abyss that this fifth trumpet blast is uh, bringing, opening up this demonic-like activity. It's not, let's start off with realizing that remember back in chapter five, four, and especially chapter five, when all creation, including the creatures under the earth, everything under the surface of terra firma are, are praising God, the creator for, for their existence and for being created. This is not an, a reference to those that all animals and creatures that reside under the surface of the earth. No, and also let's remember that this is symbolic. This is symbolic. You're not gonna find the abyss on a map, okay? <laughs> it's not gonna be on a map. This is talking about a realm, a, a, a viable, a legitimate realm but it's in uh, the spirit world. It's in the spirit world. And so first of all, this abyss is the, the home of the demonic. And it's not ha has anything to do with what, what God and what God made was good in creation, nor is it as some commentators try to make it uh, the equivalent or the same as Hades. It's not. Hades is the place 
where people reside that are awaiting the final judgment. Well, are, are Christians there? No. Christians are in paradise. Remember the saints under the all the saints that were martyred that are under the altar? Are they in Hades? No, they're with God. Okay, so and then that last one uh, has to do with uh, the lake of fire. Lake of fire is a separate place. Okay, so let's we're wrapping up there with that because we're now at the five minute point. So. Uh, Dawn can uh, scoot. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I think we lost sound. Oh, did you? Do you hear? Can you hear us? Yeah, can hear you now. Great. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Fantastic. Well, um, anybody want to close? I will. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. Father, we thank you for the illumination that you've provided for us, for our hearts, and for mm -hmm. our minds, and for our souls. And Father, we. Thank you for your plan. And we thank you that Chris has been able to present it to us to help us understand it. And Father, we ask that you would give him a blessing for his work that he's put into this. And we ask now that as we go, you would keep us safe and that you would just bless us each in the endeavors you give us for the remainder of the day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so much. Thank you. Everybody have a good Great. week. Okay, bye-bye, you guys. Bye. Bye, bye guys.